So cakes and cookies, very important. Those exudates coming out of that root system and all of these interactions. And you know, we've only begun to understand this system. We've only just started. It's my lifetime. So we have lots more to learn. All right, so that was Dr. Lane Ingham. That was an excerpt. And now I wanna show you some other sources of information. This is the Rhizosphere, this is the second edition. It's really, really useful. And the information in here goes down to very, very specific levels, down to the carbon flow, down to the chemical signaling root to root, down to nutrient acquisition, siderophores, mycorrhizal fungi, molecular biology and ecology of rhizobia, legume symbiosis, and nutrient transformations, rhizodeposition, and root exudation, as well as the possible functions, types, and amounts of compounds released into the rhizosphere. So this is an incredibly powerful resource. And so this is the specifics of what Dr. Lane Ingham is talking about. So I love this book. Um, as soon as I posted that I got this book, this was the book that John Kemp kind of revealed that he was my friend because I saw there was like the official John Kemp, right? Hiding his face, John Kemp. And then there was this other John Kemp who was my friend commenting on things all the time. But I didn't realize that that was that John Kemp. And later on, like I've talked about, I found another John Kemp. So heightens the confusion. But <laughs> this was one of those books that was so critical for my understanding of, of complexity. So, so let's go into some of the highlights here. And I'll read some of the things that I, that I, that I learned. Um, just on like page one of this, at the bottom, one gets the impression that each and every compound released has a specific role or function like Dr. Lane Ingham talks about. But the reality is that very few proposed effects are established. Some are feasible, and some, probably the majority, must remain speculative and unproven. From the time this chapter was completed in 1999, nothing seems to have changed in the sense that there is no shortage of enthusiastic speculative reviews or of fanciful titles so we have to hem the generalizations with the realities that elaine ingham herself mentions if there are millions of different exodates and they go beyond sugars as she mentions too then understanding them all is going to take time and research and funding and so it's not surprising that these university studies have been able to uncover a lot more of this information for us, which is just incredibly lucky. And, and so we get to see Elaine Ingham's theories play out. And it's incredible, but there are some caveats, contexts, and, and, and things to consider because how we describe exudation changes whether we're talking about excretion or secretion and and it's not as it's not conscious it's not as it's i mean it's straight up not conscious it's a passive thing so let's get into this a little bit more um because you know th th there are much more than just sugars being released so table 1.1 page 2 we see that sugars and polysaccharides amino acids of all sorts, organic acids, fatty acids, sterols, growth factors, enzymes, flavonoids, nucleotides, and miscellaneous like auxins, which are growth hormones, and so many other things. And, and, and that goes back to what she said at the end there, where we don't know so much. And that's how this book begins with how little they know. They talk about what they do know, what they can ascertain, but it's really clear that they're trying to come from a place of humility because the space is so vast and so large. Let's get into it a little bit more. 
Both excretion and secretion require energy, and some exudates may act as either. Okay, that's interesting. And then you have the whole issue of a lot of the organic matter, a lot of the carbon content that's being um, generated at the roots are dead cells that are being slothed off. This sometimes contributes to forming that rhizosheath. But they are being slothed off at sometimes greater degrees than the exudation that we're talking about when we think of just the cakes and cookies and sugars. So 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 there's 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 a lot more going on because I mean why would they do that? What's that going to do? Saprophytes, right? So the dead cells are going to feed saprophytes. And just like I said that there's these in situ relationships where they're caught up in that force field of the rhizosphere in the, the gel, the mucilage, the fourth phase water of the rhizosphere, they're just caught up in there and they just start munching on the dead cells from the plants, that, the cells that are slothed off. And, and then when they die, their nutrients could become available. They haven't been able to test this well. So they're not sure um, on the timing for a lot of these things because the root growth has happening so rapidly that the acidic part of the root, which is also taking a lot of the nutrients away from the soil profile, is continuing forward. So the saprophytes move in, they start breaking down the cells that are dead, you know what I mean? And there's not a lot of nutrients there to, uh, in comparison to what was there. I mean, uh, part of the process of plants growing is making nutrients, some nutrients immobile and taking up other nutrients. And, and, and sometimes they make things more bioavailable in a generalized sense like when they release digestive enzymes and it creates like a pool and then everything's kind of feasting on that pool. But it things are a little bit more, well, things are a lot more complicated, um, especially when we think about the fact that approximately 50% of fixed carbon is committed to the roots, 50% of the carbon is retained as root tissue, and the other 50 is root products. So right there, it seems like it's 25%. And that's not like what they were saying about 50% going to, to the root microbes. But in annual plant species, remember we, we talk about in averages, we talk in generalizations, but then when we shift sometimes to what matters to us specifically, golden doors of opportunity open up. And this is one of those. So in annual plant species, we're on page 24, 30 to 60% of photosynthetically fixed carbon is translocated to the root and a considerable proportion of this up to 70% can be released into the rhizosphere. So 70% of 60% is much closer to 50%, right? <laughs> but, but still we're, we're seeing there's a secondary level to this it's not just down to the roots and it's 50 percent goes into the soil profile the roots are in the soil profile so when we say you know 50 percent is on top and 50 percent is below ground it's generalization and we got to be careful of those because they sound like absolutism sometimes even if they're true right and 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 so it's a proportion it, it, it's a portion of the, that carbon that's actually being released. And then let's dig a little bit deeper into this because <sighs> there's retrieval mechanisms. So cakes and cookies and sugars and it's going out, it's ex exuding and it's creating this force field and it, it, it's investing and it's waiting on those microbes to, to get, to give back all their, their, their investment. Well, that you've heard me say that th at first this is like a shotgun effect, right? And sometimes they're, you know, simple sugars and that's what attracts the pests and pathogens. Sometimes they're polysaccharides and that attracts our friends and beneficial microorganisms. Well, that's the truth. The reality is 
in that situation, when there's no microbes to meet it, when, you know, most of the exudation is just having no effect, they, they, they literally can't afford to just keep doing that. So that's why, of course, nature has a retrieval method. So carbon flow in the rhizosphere is not a strictly unidirectional process from root to soil. Active retrieval mechanisms for sugars and amino acids have been identified in plant roots, which were capable of recovering up to 90% of the exudates passively lost into the rhizosphere. Notice that word passive. Uh, we're on page 30 of the rhizosphere. If you're ever going to get this book, um, it's fabulous. It's detailed. It's high level. It's challenging. It, you know, challenges a lot of the basic and generalized statements and assumptions that, um, that have come before. And that's why I included them in my book. So, and, and in, in this course, so that we can really navigate these things in a way that will allow us to talk to these experts to talk to you know people who are applying the, the these this expertise and and be at that cutting edge with everyone so mechanisms of root exudation on the next page release of the major lmw organic constituents of root exudates such as sugars amino acids carboxylic acid and phenolics is a passive process along the steep concentration gradient which usually exists between the cytoplasm of intact root cells and the external soil solution. So this is like coming out of the cells themselves. It's, it, this, is, this is an incredible thing that's happening here, but it's passive. So they are, they are emanating these this these this energy the whether it's protons sometimes hydroxides right they're emanating these things and remember the fourth phase water helps it to do that and it's 360 degrees it's in all directions it's it's an amazing process but but it's more complicated than just cakes, cakes and cookies and sugars but that was a great metaphor to begin with to get people thinking about this we don't need to like try to, you know, extend too far. Sometimes we go too far with metaphors and like talking about cakes and different things. And, 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 and the reality is much more complicated, right? So they, they, they have a hard time telling sometimes some of these exits from some of these organic cells that are being released and some of these other things. Is it a secretion like purposely being released? Is it an excretion? It's just coming out because they can't help it. Is it, a little bit of both, right? Because I, I, you know, exodus can be both. So, so it's it's really fascinating to delve into this, to analyze it, to see how slippery some of these definitions are, how the scientists themselves are struggling with it, how there is this call for caution around making too generalized statements or taking those generalized statements as absolutisms within the soil science community, which I am part of and I want to represent properly. And so I, I just want to like bring that complexity, show how, how awesome Elaine Ingham's work has been and is and how, yes, it is true, but there are these caveats, contexts, complexities, layers, um, and new insights that are necessary to add into this. And to speak more specifically about exudates and their focus, remember the rhizophagy cycle as I say this. Rovira and Davy, for example, found that the region of the meristemic cells behind the root tip is a site of major exudation of sugars and amino acids. And that's also where it's the most acidic. So this is where the most energy is being released. The most sugars are being released. Um, it's the most acidic. So there's the most protons being released. And as you go down the route, it becomes more alkaline. It becomes more oxidized. All the actions happening in front, which really begs the question, what is it favoring? What is the majority of what's going on here? Well, 
if the majority of exudation is right there at the root tip behind the marrow stem cells, then they are feeding the rhizophagy cycle, not the microbes on the outside that are being consumed by protozoa and nematodes, which leads to this vital point that I'll come to again, that rhizophagy is the primary way that plants feed mycorrhizal fungi, hijacked that pathway, and 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 then and and, and did its thing, but the plant relies upon rhizophagy first and primarily and the soil food web is a pathway it's just one of the pathways we'll get into more specifics and we'll get into all the pathways now soil is the linchpin to life to civilization to health if we want a healthy future to fight environmental collapse, to live regeneratively and ethically, and to experience a life of abundance and freedom. We want healthy and abundant soil everywhere. But that means we need to relearn old ways and learn some new ways to build, cycle, and partner with soil and soil life. We can change the world radically but it's up to us. We have to make those choices. We have to partner with soil and soil life. It takes our participation and support. Will you join us? Regenerative Soil, the full program, we're going to dive deep. We're gonna be looking commercial, we're gonna be looking DIY, we're gonna be going garden, we're gonna be going farm scale. We're going to cover it all. We want to serve everyone at all levels and we want to create that fluency micro to macro so that we can spread the regeneration of our soil, our ecosystems, all our systems all across the world. You can do this. You can regenerate soil because regenerative soil is the linchpin for life. It's the linchpin for all systems all of our civilization everything is running on this everything is based on this everything is relying upon this check out the link down below sign up and and join us in regenerative soil the full online course you're not going to want to miss it i'm matt powers grow abundantly learn daily and live regeneratively